hump day. Wednesday. Hump day. The halfway mark. Yeah. The 50-yard line. Mm. Had a great show today. Got a lot to get to. First and 10? <laughs> yeah, it's first and 10. Take a shot. We got to get going up tempo. So we call Josh Heupel something. Yeah, it's crazy. We're kicking the ball off. We just scored. So. Well, again, I don't know why you have to ruin it every time. How does that ruin like, it? I that's it's just it like, yeah, well, you say like, regardless, oh, it's Monday. Oh, it's first and 10 from the 20. We're, we're driving. Or, oh, it's Tuesday. We're at the 40. It's yeah. second and four. Let's, let's throw a, we're a little bit of play action. Blaine scores on every play. He's well, like, oh, well, that's hilarious because we just scored again. Welcome to it. Best offense in the nation. That's how we do things. Yeah. Just wait till he gets playoffs. You ain't, yeah. you ain't LSU. We're not scared of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently the committee is. <laughs> Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers is trending toward returning for the tech for Texas next season. Georgia moves to the top of the college football playoff rankings. Thanks for finally agreeing with us. And we're previewing our best bets for college football week 12 and much more. I'm Jay Crane, and welcome to Crane & Company. Now, it was being, being reported yesterday, and rumors were swirling, that Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers is 90% sure he's going to return to Texas next year instead of going into the NFL draft, which, in reality, he's going to get his grade back and make his own decision. But this is a loaded quarterback class going into this year's draft. And you see guys like Jaden Daniels stock going up. So it does make sense for Quinn to at least entertain it. Now, after hearing that, the whole internet and college football realm in general went nuts about what's next for Arch Manning. Should he stay? Should he transfer if Quinn Ewers were to return? Well, to me, number one, you're disregarding Malik Murphy, who's a year older and has proven that he can come in and get the job done, even though there's a lot of growth that needs to happen. He got away with a couple turnovers against Kansas State. But secondly, in a transfer portal era, where so many people have a problem with kids being able to leave willy-nilly, the first thing that 85% of people do, including the sports media, is talk about a kid leaving when somebody decides to return or something happens that adversely affects his quote-unquote future. Well, I'm here to say Arch Manning would be smart to stay at Texas if Quinn Ewers returns for a couple reasons. One, Arch may not be ready yet. Now, guys have balled out from all different levels of high school, from 1A through 7A. I don't know how if it goes up to 9A or whatever in Texas. But guys have balled out from all different types of divisions. But every guy's clock isn't the same. Arch may not be ready to come in and be the starter in the SEC even after a redshirt year. It may not be the best thing for him. The second thing, Quinn Ewers has shown us he gets hurt at some point every single season. So Arch will have a chance to come in, and whether it's in mop-up duty at the end of the game or an important game, like we saw Malik Murphy have to come in against Kansas State, he will get an opportunity, at least that's what Quinn Ewers has shown us. And lastly, Malik Murphy probably is gone if Quinn, if Quinn Ewers returns, which makes Arch Manning the backup quarterback, which gives him a chance to, quote-unquote, compete for the job in fall and come in if Quinn gets hurt or something else happens. So my answer to the Arch Manning people saying he needs to transfer, oh, this is the end of the world, is look at a guy like Carson Beck who took his time, made sure he was ready. And when he comes in and he gets a shot, he makes the most of it. He not only survives, but he thrives. So we'll see with Arch Manning in the transfer portal. But my advice is, same thing Sugarland said, said. Why don't you stay? Hmm. I'm going to yeah, bring song. in my co-host, former Michigan quarterback. He knows a thing or two about playing the position at a high level, David Cohn. My brother, former Western State Colorado wide receiver, Blaine Crane. And guys, I think Inside Texas, which is the on three affiliate, I believe, of, of Texas. So shout out, you know, Shannon Terry and, and his group for being able to, to break this. And we'll see what happens. But they said there's a 90% chance that Quinn Ewers is going to return this mm-hmm. year. And I just, it's hard for me to square the fact that the same people that are screaming about the transfer portal are the first ones to come on here and scream somebody needs to go into the transfer <laughs> portal. We talk about guys waiting their turn, right? Being able to, to bounce back from adversity. And it's not like, Arch Manning tore his ACL, or he's having to come back from some devastating injury. It's the possibility of Quinn Ewers coming back for another year. I laid out all the reasons why Arch Manning will get a shot. But David, as somebody who has gone through the process of trying to get themselves ready to play at the highest level of college football quarterback, everybody's clock is different. Why do people just assume that Arch Manning is is 
the next coming of, of the greatest the greatest quarterback of all time and that he's ready right now. He may not be ready. And you know who knows that? The Mannings. Oh, they yeah. know it better than anybody. Oh, no doubt. And I wasn't surprised at all to hear Quinn Ewers is returning. He's been injured the, pe- the previous two seasons. And this is the deepest quarterback class that we've seen in quite some time with all these, you know, the extra COVID eligibility. So I wasn't surprised. And to be honest with you, I don't think he's the last big time quarterback in this class that'll make a decision to come back again next year. Now on the Arch Manning front, I, I 100% don't think he should or will transfer. I mean, the Manning family is so calculated. They had to anticipate for every possible scenario. Like it, it couldn't just be a given that when you send Arch to Texas, that Quinn Ewers is automatically going to go pro and Arch will be taking over the starting job the moment Texas enters the SEC, even though that's what we had been talking about. And it made sense. That seems like the plan. And it could still work like that. Maybe he's that good. Maybe he wins the starting job. I have a hard time believing Quinn Ewers comes back and doesn't win the starting job. But for a quarterback that's gotten injured both the last two years, you're 100% right. You're going to tell me that kid's not going to find a way on the field at Texas next year when they're in the SEC. And if you're that good, maybe he doesn't get give up the starting job. You know, in these days, it's not just in college, but in the NFL too, these guys are starting so early. And it, it's incredible when I look, because because the when I went to Michigan, the plan was to me told like, hey, you're going to sit behind Chad Henning, hopefully two years, you red shirt, you put on 35 pounds, and maybe you'll start in three years from now. That would be the ideal situation. It was never like, hey, you know, you come in and you're going to be the starting quarterback next week. Now, one thing they always wanted everyone to do was prepare like the starter and see if you could at least be the backup to one of these guys. Like, they probably wanted um, Arch Main to come in and be the backup this year. Well, that ended up being Malik Murphy. He's going to have a say in this, too. Is he going to leave? You know, we're going to see all sorts of movement, but I don't think uh, Arch Manning should panic about this. No, I, I don't either, and, and I think it's you know, low-key disrespectful that people are just looking over Malik Murphy, a guy that came in and helped get them through the rough patch until Quinn got back. Not saying that Malik Murphy is going to end up being, you know, a a, a top five pick uh, in the NFL draft. But I think he, he does give you an opportunity to do some things, even though, in my opinion, he's probably out the door. He's a year older. Looks like Chip Kelly may get fired at UCLA. This mm-hmm. kid's from Inglewood. Caleb Williams, you know, it, again, you never want to assume, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be going to the NFL draft. Uh, you know, what would happen out there at USC? I know Lincoln's recruited really well at the quarterback position. So I, I would be more surprised if if Arch left than if Malik, or excuse me, it, I would be more surprised if Malik Murphy didn't leave just because of where his clock is and the opportunities he's going to uh, get, which kind of solves a problem, I would think, for Texas. But Blaine, you know, we look at NIL now. You know, this may be one of those situations where, uh, Texas has enough money to keep a guy who may not get the best grade or may not go as high as he would the next year to be able to come back because you can still make money now as a player with NIL. But when you look at, at, at Quinn Ewers, I want to ask you this. Hmm. How good do you think Quinn Ewers is? <clears throat> come on, draft you think day? he's come on, where he's going to go on draft day? Yeah, I'm saying right, right, right now, into this year, you're sitting here looking at, at some of the quarterbacks that we got that are going to be in this draft. Penix, Caleb Williams, Bo Nix. Jaden Daniels, yeah. I can go down the list. Like, where's Quinn Ewers? I'd say he's a day three guy. I don't think that's crazy. I don't think Quinn's, right. I mean, I think I, Quinn's gotten better, but I don't think he's improved massive amounts. You know, if anything, he's, he came back and did not look great in that TCU game. He looked hurt to me. His, his arm strength is still a question. Everyone falls in love with arm angles and this and that. You got to remember, like, arm strength is big when it comes to the NFL. So I think Quinn's a good quarterback. I don't think he's a great one. And if anything, it makes sense that Quinn needs to stay this year, I mean, you look at the guys that are staying. I mean, Shadur is going to stay. You have big names that are going to stay. And you look around the landscape of college football. If Arch were to leave, right, where would Arch be locked in to start at, at a big program? Not USC. I mean, USC has a hell of a backup quarterback. Um, the five-star kids coming into Georgia, it's not going to work there. Is Jackson Dart staying <clears throat> at Ole Miss. You know, so if Arch, you got to look at the landscape. Um, you got to look on the other side of what it's going to look like before you make a decision. And I think the, the best thing for Arch is to do is to stay, is to stay. You just can't run him out there and just think, oh, since his last name's Manning, he's about to come dice. You saw him at A Day. He not ready. No, like he. But look, I'm, he shouldn't be ready. I, I, I think it'll be best for him. I start maybe his junior year or whatever it is. Well, say, sophomore I, year. Like, look, the kid played three A high school ball, which I wasn't impressed with when I saw it. There's a reason. Look, if Arch was good enough, his ass would be out there. He would. Like, Steve's going to put the best player on the field. Right now, you're the third-string quarterback on that depth chart, all right? Malik's probably gone next year if Quinn. Malik can get a starting job somewhere.
But if arts, you need to build this, you need to stay and learn, especially first year coming in there. Yeah, season. well, if you're if you're talking about a junior as like a true junior, because you know next year he'll be a redshirt freshman, then the next year he'll be a redshirt That's sophomore. Right. So he will be a draft true So, well, no, it's a true junior. Academically, you're a junior. You've been in school That's for three years. Yeah. Like so, but, but I don't look at. I don't go by your academic years. Yeah. I'm going by what you are football eligibility wise. Uh, and now with COVID, hell, you could play 30. Who knows? Sam Hartman may come back again for for a 45th year uh, to, like to that, try and run it back. That's seriously worth a conversation. Like, how much more time do these guys get? Like, there, it's the wild, wild west. It should be cut off now. I don't know what the rules are. No, it should be cut off now. Like, do they, like, the guys just get to play as long as they want? to? I don't know. I've, I've been sending Auburn letters every week. To get another year for you? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. dude, do I got a year? Why not? Hugh, what's up? Listen, uh, I'll Remember, hold the Texas hell not only joining the SEC, but they have Michigan in the non conference next yeah. year, week yeah. two, something like that. Like that. It's like there, there could be a hero opportunity for Art somewhere next year. Well, well, I, I, I think it's at some point next year at Texas. Like, again, Quinn Ewers has shown us every year he gets hurt at some point. Like, all it takes is one time of him getting hurt, Arch Manning to go in and ball out against. Mississippi State or somebody, and then all of a sudden, here we go. Turn the lights on. Like, why is Steven Spielberg at my house? Like, already making the move. Why is there already a thirty for thirty about Arch Manning? It just, I, I'm very interested to see how it plays out. But I just, I love how the first reaction is, "Oh, Quinn Ewers is returning. Arch Manning's got to leave. I know. <laughs> He's got to leave, or his career's over." Like, we we just have no patience, and that's at all positions, man. Plus, he said 90%, right? 90%. It's trending that way. And honestly, as deep as the class is, you may think, oh, these NFL teams will wait longer in the draft to take quarterbacks because there's so many coming out. But the quarterback market is so inflated in the NFL. Yeah. You may see the opposite of that. You may see guys trying to trying to uh, pick quarterbacks up early in the second, maybe mid-second, who would traditionally be day three guys because they need an answer. Should J.J. McCarthy stay? J.J. McCarthy, I, it, I think it's going to depend on how this season plays out. He's another one of those guys. Like, I don't think it's an automatic given fact that he's going to go to the NFL, even though it makes a little bit more sense for him to make that jump than Quinn Ewers just because Quinn, Quinn hasn't played a complete season yet. I think it'll depend, man. Do, do they lose a gut-riching game? Against the Buckeyes, do they lose, you know, in the playoff or the national championship and J.J. McCarthy wants to run it back with those guys? I don't know. Oh, what happens man. with Jim Harbaugh? I don't know. Like, these are some of the names. Caleb Williams, Drake May, Shadur Sanders, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix Jr., Bo Nix, Quinn, Quinn Stays, Jane Daniels, Michael Pratt, Riley Leonard, Cam Ward, Spencer Radler, Tyler Van Dyke, Jordan Travis. The, this is too deep. If you're a quarterback, this is the year to stay unless you're going top. Mm. Yeah, if I'm Michael Pratt at Tulane, I'm staying. I'm staying, yeah. I mean, I don't know what year. I mean, I'm Riley transferring. Leonard, I'm I think he's got, a, he's got a transfer year. I don't know. I feel like Riley Leonard's one of those guys that's going to go in there and Translate. Take all those tests, and they're just going to fall in love with them. Like, somebody will fall in love with them. He just translates to the NFL. Oh, they'll, they'll fall in love with them, yeah. 100%. Uh, well, we hope we, uh, you, you're falling in love with the show. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Going to get to the chat in one second. But we all know being in the grocery store during the holidays, it's like being stuck in the maze. I don't want to be the maze runner. Mm. That's not me. All right? Don't even get me started on the wine aisle. We know how it goes on, especially during Thanksgiving. All right, people are pouring up, that's for sure. Between the people crowding the aisle, the giant selection, and my limited knowledge of wine, I always end up just grabbing the same bottle and running to the checkout. That's what I do, right? I just take the, the low-hanging fruit, just the truth, pun intended. But with First Leaf, they take the stress out of finding new wine. And when you sign up for First Leaf, they run you through a quiz. They, they figure out what type of wine you, is best suited for you. I took this, we, we get a box every month. Just had a box showed up the other day yeah. when you were over there uh, on, on Saturday. Uh, and, and there's all different types, you know, the, the different grapes. It, it's, they make it so unbelievably easy, and they ship it right to you. Uh, it's on your schedule, right to your door. I choose the day my shipment comes, and I never stress about missing a delivery. And every sele selection is backed by First Leap's 100% satisfaction guarantee. Husbands, get yeah. this for your wife. Easy gift. She's going to love it. It's the gift that keeps on giving. All right, so find the wine you'll love this holiday season with First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com slash booster. That's tryfirstleaf.com slash booster to sign up, and you'll get your first six hand-curated bottles for just $44.95. That's T-R-Y-F-I-R-S-T-L-E-A-F.com slash booster. Tryfirstleaf.com slash booster. I'm telling you guys, trust me on this one. Y'all know I know that you know I know, okay? <laughs> and also, grab some merch. We're going to put the link in here. We've got 
Should, should, I, should I drop the, Should I drop a hint? Black about, Friday stuff. We got some Black Friday stuff. Should, should I tell them about the, the H word? The H word? Should I say the H word? No. No? No. Well, you just said it. Whoops. Maybe. Just grab some merch. We got some great stuff in there and some other stuff coming. Um, some surprises, some great Black Friday deals as well. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Booster Club. All right, chats. Have a good day today. Hit that like and subscribe button and let's get going. Connor Montgomery says, why would you ever leave Sark's offense? For getting out of NIL, you're in one of the best systems offensively, and you're joining the SEC. Stay put, Art. Yeah, well, what are the only three letters that make more money than NIL? NFL. And that's what Steve Sarkeesian prepares his quarterbacks to do. You're not going to be in a system that translates more to the league, that gives you the opportunity to, to you know, wor- work a, a play call sheet and work through a game plan that has every aspect in it from – your play action from from it's not a gimmicky offense, even though I hate that word. You do stuff under center. You do stuff from gun. You, you get into the red zone. There is intricate passing combinations and checks and things like that. It will prepare Steve Sarkeesian's offense prepares quarterbacks for the NFL probably as good, if not better, than any other system out there because he knows. I mean, he did it. All right, let's go to Papa John. What's up, Papa? I would love some pizza, man. Oh no, no H and John. I see how it is. He says Quinn isn't ready for the NFL. Another year would benefit his skill set. As he mentioned, he is also made of glass. Is the injury bug real with Quinn Ewers? Yeah, well, sometimes every time I wipe my eyes with Quinn Ewers, I see Samuel L. Jackson from Unbreakable just at the comic book store. Just, oh, no, I hit my arm in the door. It's shattered. And listen, he's taking some big hits. I mean, we remember the, the ones last year. And I will say, Quinn will stand in there and take a hit. Oh, yeah. I want to give him credit on that. But uh, he has he has been injury prone, and that's a real thing. I know he doesn't want that. I don't think he's faking it. But some guys are just injury prone. That's the way this sport works out when you're playing a sport where two grown men running each other at full speed that have been lifting weights and getting pissed off all year. So I, I think that is something to look at uh, going forward. I mean, we see guys in the league. Jimmy Garoppolo is kind of the same way, right? Plays four games. All of a sudden, you know, why is my leg facing the other way? It just, it's a real thing. I'll tell you another one on the college level is Michael Penix Jr. Yeah. With a ton of different injuries. And now look at him. He's playing a complete season. You know, I mean, knock on wood here. We got to get him through the rest of it. But he's at the top of a lot of Heisman boards right now, undefeated. All right, let's go to Joseph Fine, the third. He says, Arch ain't going to no Poe Dunk Auburn, Alabama. People need to quit saying it. (laughs) First of all, Joseph, that's God's country down there. All right. Uh, Listen, there's a lot of places in the state of Alabama that are Poe Dunk. A lot. Been to a lot of them. A lot of them that are right around Auburn. Been a day Auburn's not one of them. Auburn is not. Uh, one. Yeah, Auburn is. Uh, Auburn is uh, compared to those. It's Auburn's like Pleasantville. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like uh, what is the one? Where's Thor and them live? God, what's it called? Ragnarok. No, what's the the place where? Don't Thor look and them at me. Thor. <laughs> yeah, and like <laughs> Odin in the movies and Avengers. Where do they live? What's the name? Of the, it's not Oscar, man. That's from Harry Potter. No, that's a whole different thing. Look, what, 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 what do y'all like? Where does Thor live? What, how do you feel about? <laughs> How would you Ragnarok. feel about the fit? Ragnarok. Thank you. It is Ragnarok. That's what it's called. Yeah. How I would don't you know. Feel about the, the, the fit with Arch at Auburn, though. Just play it out hypothetically here. See, I don't. I don't, I, I don't know if he runs well enough to run that RPO that's what I was, that's Like, what I'm I, I don't think. Again, it's not just about you know who it is. It's how they play. Yeah. Like Arch Manning needs to be in a pro style system. He needs to be in Steve Sarkeesian's system. Or Lane somebody Kiffin. like that. Yeah. Lane Kiffin. You know, Lane does. I think Lane wants that wants that running quarterback, that running element a little bit. Like Jackson Dart, I think is like kind of the perfect kind of Lane Stiffen, uh, Lane Stiffen, Lane Kiffin. Uh, that's when that's when Lane gets suspended. <laughs> Lane Stiffen, Lane, baby. Lane Stiffen's who comes out when Lane gets suspended. Yeah, I love it. Oh. Hey, I've only heard good things about this guy cooking it up in the van. Well, what's his name? Walker White. Yeah. <laughs> Walker White. Yeah. That five star. Listen. Yeah. Listen. Talk about perfect. Come in. We'll see what happens next year. You know, Michael Pratt from Tulane. Wouldn't hate that. No, I hate it. Wouldn't hate it. You'd hate it? I want Malik Murphy. Really? Give me Malik. I don't know. Give me Michael Pratt. Look, dude's got curly hair and he's out there making plays. I believe in it. Let's go to Christina. Hashtag ask CNC. With NIL on the floors being raised for a lot of teams, the transfer portal as crazy as last year, are we going to see more people stay compared to last year? I, I think it's so. it's it's kind of like the the coaching carousel. I mean, the, the market's going to change, you know, each year by, by what's out there and and you know what spots are available at what place. You're always going to have people going to the portal. You're always going to have people that go into the portal thinking they're going to wind up somewhere. We don't talk enough about the people that end up nowhere. 
Yeah. Like uh, that's that, there's like a high percentage of kids that go in the portal and end up just not playing again and ends up being a bad decision. Um, so look, I, numbers wise, I think it'll probably so, somewhat be close to the same every year. You'll get some years that there's some anomalies. There's just so many more guys that enter the portal because maybe more head coaches get fired and there's more movement. But I think it's probably going to stay around the same number. That uh, not, not the exact same number, but in that realm, right? You have the think? prime effect too. A lot of guys going out to play at yeah. Colorado with prime, but you know we'll see. Let's go to K Warrior. He says, "Don't forget that Quinn left high school a year early. Mm-hmm. He's only 20 years old. He should be a true sophomore if he didn't leave high school early." That's a good that, point. That is that is very true. I mean, he has been in the college weight room now. You know, he's been at you know it's multiple programs, but he's he's been in the college weight room now, uh, long enough now where. You know, it's it's. I, I don't think the effect of him leaving early is is there anymore. Uh, but but again, like there used to be a time, not you know, a time so long long ago. It's like a Star Wars where red shirting and David brought this up. Like red shirting is sometimes the best thing that can happen to you. Like that that it was almost like a rite of passage to be able to to then go play. And then before that, you know, it was freshmen weren't allowed to play. On, on the varsity level, which I think is a stupid rule. And if you're the best player, you need to be able to play. But we have gone literally from eras of young college players do not play to some young college players play to young college players are expected to not only play, but start as freshmen and come in and ball out. It's just showing you kind of the evolution of the sport. But yeah, Quinn is young um, and, and needs more time. But I, I think Arch needs more time. I was going to Chase Mills, hashtag ask Cranian Code. Do we see a similar thing at OU with the QBs that we are at at UT? Just depends. I mean, does Dylan Gabriel have a 35th year to, to be able to come back? That's the problem with this COVID rule. Like, nobody really deep down knows. I mean, you send a waiver to the NCAA that they're either going to grant it uh, automatically or you get like a, a you know, a, a Tez situation, Tez Walker situation in North Carolina where they just sit there and drag their feet and drag their feet and, oh, Game five, guess what? You're eligible. I, I don't trust the NCAA to, to enforce whatever they do evenly across the board. I don't expect a blanket rule. So I think it's like David said, it's a free-for-all. Who the hell knows? If we're going to be honest, mm-hmm. like if I'm a coach, I don't know how you operate in this world. I don't know how you do it. You know, there's a reason they had to, to make it where you can sign 85 guys in one class. It used to be you get 25 scholarships per class, re- regardless. Now, since the craziness of the transfer portal – and guys returning and doing all this, they're like, look, if you got to get rid of, of 80, your 85 guys on scholarship and bring in another 85, that's now, that's now not against the rules. So it just shows you it is the wild, wild west. But speaking of the wild, wild west, the college football playoff rankings mm. came out yesterday, yes, David. And uh, we had some movement at the top. Starting to look a little bit similar to whose? I don't Ours, know. A little the bit. one we've had? Maybe the watching time? the show. Maybe y'all are starting to come around a little bit. But, uh, David, what did you think? All right, so they moved. Uh, hold on, I'm pulling the. Got Georgia at one. Here. They moved Georgia up to one, which I was glad to see because honestly, that's where we thought they should have been this mm-hmm. whole time. Again, though, I when when Boo Corgan gets up there and explains the decision decision making process, I'm not sold. I'm not sold that they're watching all these games yeah. and that they have any sort of metric. And I'll tell you why, because clearly they had put OSU at the very top and said the strength of schedule is better, and we're combining the eye test. That's why we have Georgia mm-hmm. at two. Now they flip that and they've said, okay, you know, they're way just this past weekend, clearly, with a win over Ole Miss. And when asked about it, he said, yeah, they were tied at 13, and then Georgia scored like, you know, 30-something points straight, and that was impressive to us. Like, man, that's your metric? But then when you look at Michigan, who they left at three, who also went on the road and had a top-10 win, there's no movement there. Um, So I'm just, I'm a little bit worried. I I, I still feel like it is going to work itself out with the committee. I'm just a little bit worried that they really have no metric for box score rankings. guys, man. They da- seem like box score guys. Yeah. David, this is what literally led the show, led, uh, had put a video out on it. There is no criteria. This, there is, there, it is, there are really no stringent, just like we have in NIL, just like we have in the transfer portal. There are no guardrails. There is no Honest truth. And I think it should be a mix of things. And it's not easy to do. But there should be some baseline rules. So, again, like you said, you had Ohio State at number one because of strength of schedule because it's about this year. Yet you still had Florida State at four. Mm -hmm. And they didn't move up. Georgia beats Ole Miss at home against a top-ranked team. You said, it's great, right? Then you move them up to number one after they beat Ole Miss and move Ohio State down. So, 
Now we're saying that Georgia's schedule this year and resume is better than Ohio State's? Did y'all just flip that quick Mm -hmm. because of one game? So what does that mean? When Ohio State plays Michigan going into that week, you're going to flip them again because their strength of schedule is now harder? But it still doesn't make sense because Florida State is number four, right? And the rest of it, I really got no problem with other than, you know, I'm a little bit surprised that that we got no movement uh, in between, you know, Texas, Oregon, and Alabama. I thought they may move some there. Not that Alabama should be in front of Texas, but I'm looking at Oregon, and I'm just wondering. I think Oregon has a really good chance to make the playoff. I would pick Oregon right now to beat Washington. But why is Oregon in front of Texas and Alabama? Yeah, I mean, like, that's what the, – we were having that conversation, right? If it matters, oh, though, about the schedule this year, if it matters, like, who is Oregon – Not to, I would pick Oregon to beat Texas. I think Oregon-Alabama would be a hell of a game right now. I don't know. That'd be a pick to me. But but explain to me who's Oregon beaten. This is why that triangle right there of Oregon, Texas, and Alabama, all the first three one-loss teams is so difficult. Because if we're just going by, hey, I watch a lot of football and I'm going to apply the eye test on who I think should make the college football playoff and who's trending the right way and playing the best, then to me it goes Alabama, Oregon, and Texas. But the fact that Texas has the head-to-head win on the road in Tuscaloosa by double digits, that's what's thrown this off because you have to keep Texas ahead of Alabama. And so the option is either put Oregon at six, okay, or you have to drop them below both of those one-loss teams. And I, they're playing better than Texas to me. Well, it's, and, and look, I get that, but this is what happens when you don't have like concrete rules. Yeah. Because if you had concrete rules, you'd say, okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Let's go by what we had. Ohio State at one because of strength of schedule and it matters right now. Mm-hmm. Florida State at two, right? And we're going to get into ours. I'm, I'm going to throw it up because, uh, because, again, you're going off of what matters this year. Why would you not just put Texas at six, Bama at seven, and Oregon at eight? And the beautiful part about this is Oregon is probably going to have to play Washington again. That's the way it's looking. Washington's got a hell of a game against Oregon State. Oregon's still got to play Oregon State. But that's going to work itself out. The problem that I have with it is Alabama, Texas, and Oregon are all in different conferences. They are not going to play each other. Texas and Alabama have already played each other, and Texas beat them on the road. I'm still not understanding. I understand why Washington's at five. I think you make a case for moving Washington up, right? But I don't understand why Oregon is at six, and then it's Texas and Bama, because you're going to get a chance to move that back up. But we'll see. I feel like, once again, though, we have the best college football ranking. Now, they had Missouri at 9 yeah, and shout Louisville out at 10, which was nice because we had we kept, uh, we kept moved Louisville to 9 and had Missouri at 10. But similar thinking there. The Definitely. I mean, how, how great is this for drink? You yeah. go finish and go get your 10-win season. You're the third best team in the SEC. Yeah, go play in a New Year's Six. the third That's best wild. team in the SEC, which is crazy to and say. And they've proven it week in and week out. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy to say. But, I mean, it's, it's a CFP playoff committee. They know nothing. They really know nothing, and it's sad. I mean, I'm sorry. I just can't look at Ohio State and give the eye test and say they're better in Georgia. Yeah. In what world? Less, it's less to me about the actual order they have right now and more about the communication. Like, they're, they're not getting up there and telling us exactly what the metrics well, are. Because you can't, David, there's not one. I know. Like, that's look, the thing. Anytime it's, you add a level of subjectivity to it, you're always eventually going to end at this problem. But you could just communicate so well at the front end, you know, and then always end on, this was our final It just decision. feels like, what have you done late, lately type of thing. That's, that's exactly what it, what it is. Feel. They're trying to appease everybody and hope it works out. That's Because they're going to they're gonna fluctuate it to make piss off one fan base one week, then the next week reward them, and then piss off the other one. It's like trying to explain a Jackson Pollock painting, to bring that back. Or one of these abstract paintings where, like, somebody just puts paint all over themselves and just, like, rolls all over a canvas or just gets a bucket of paint and throws it on there. You want to know why nobody can explain it? Because there's nothing to explain. It's all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's no concrete, not saying that. And the eye test, I think, should go into it. To me, like I've said, it should be a combination of your, your strength of resume obviously, the eye test and returning experience from the year before. Like Michigan is a great example, right? And and how you're playing right now. I feel like all that goes in the pot. But you have to have standard baseline rules. You have to have, 
your commandments, per se, of the college football playoff rankings. But let's here's go ahead and pull ours. The, I don't know if we have a graphic of ours. You, you want me to read ours off? Yeah, read ours off. Georgia, Michigan, we got Florida State, OSU, Washington. Those are the five undefeated mm-hmm. teams. Then our order with Oregon, one loss. Texas, one loss. Mm-hmm. Alabama, one loss stays the same. Then Louisville and Missouri. And that rounds out the top. So the only thing that changed for us was Louisville and Missouri. Yes, that's correct. Now, a couple things we know. Two versus three are going to play each other yep. next weekend, right? And one of them is going to lose, and the other one's going to play in the Big Ten Championship. One verse eight are already slated to play each other in the SEC Championship. One of them has to win. One of them has to lose. Now, five and six are either going to play each other or one's going to lose before then, which makes things kind of complicated in the Pac-12. And then on top of that, four and 10 are either going to play in the ACC Championship or lose before then. Yeah, and and here's the, the death scenario, I think, for the committee. What they are hoping does not happen the most is that Florida State wins out, Michigan wins out. Mm-hmm. They're both in. Bama beats Georgia in the SEC Championship. Oregon wins out, beat Washington in the Pac-12 Championship, and Texas wins out and wins the Big 12 Championship. Mm-hmm. So you have two undefeated teams they are automatically in. The last two spots go to two of the three of a one-loss Alabama who won the SEC, who just beat Georgia, a one-loss Texas who won the Big 12, who beat Alabama, and a one-loss Oregon who just beat Washington in the Pac-12 championship. So there's three teams for two spots there. I think in my opinion, and probably most people, if you take your bias out of it, doesn't matter if I'm from Auburn, doesn't matter if I'm from Auburn, Washington, Texas beating Alabama puts Texas in over Bama, right? Which puts Texas in. You have to put Texas in, right? So that's three. So now it comes down to one loss Oregon, who just beat Washington, whose only loss is on the road to the team that they just beat. And then you have one loss Bama, whose only loss is at home against uh, against Texas, who's in the playoff, who just beat Georgia. And why that's so tough is the way Alabama's playing. They could 100% win the national championship. The end of the regular season's next week, and we're talking about one through eight could win the national I th- Which is fantastic. Great. It's awesome. Let's have a playoff. Let's have a 12 team this year. We should do a 12 team yeah, this year. The Crane and Company. What's stopping us? The Crane and Company 12 team playoff. Y'all can set team. it up. It can't be that tough. Right? Like, we can figure out locations. Like, like we can get it done. All right? Like, we can. You give me three days, I'll get it handled. Streaming on Daily Wire Plus. Hours. Yeah. That'd be dope. That'd be super dope. But no, that's that's the death scenario. Then it comes into, oh, was Bo Nix going to win the Heisman? Can you keep the guy who's going to win the Heisman with one loss? I, it would get very, very interesting very, very quickly. But we want to know what you think in the comments. Let us know. We have calls opening up here. Line opens in 14 minutes. Going to get to those. Try and get those a little early, too. If you call in and it's on hold, just let us take a call and then call back in. I get asked 300 times every day, hey, I'm calling in. I can't get through, which is great, right, in one sense. But awful in another sense, Uh, once somebody answers the phone, then you can get back in there. But first, David, let's get to a little rapid fire. All right, let's go rapid fire. First, I want to talk about this Mississippi State job. So Zach Arnett was fired. They started four and six here. Obviously, you know, he took over after the passing of Coach Mike Leach. What is Mississippi State going to do next? And what's Zach Arnett going to do next? You know, this is a tough situation because Zach got thrust into this after what happened, obviously, you know, Mike Leach, may he rest in peace, one of one of our favorites. And, you know, I, I thought Mississippi State was smart with the way they handled the contract when they brought him in. They gave him an opportunity, which is all you can ask in this situation, right? They could have made him an interim and then went out and got somebody else, but, but they gave him a chance. You remember how they kind of rallied in the bowl game? And uh, I think Zach is going to be a, a really good head coach one day. Just seems like he's not ready, so go enjoy your time maybe at LSU as the D.C., and then get back, or I don't know, maybe go out there to USC, or we'll see with some of the other movement that goes on. If Sam Pittman gets fired from Arkansas, who gets that job? Um, But if I'm Mississippi State now, there's two names, right? And we said this before the Jamie Chadwell Twitter thing yesterday, which in my opinion was Photoshopped. If you don't know, it looked like Jamie Chadwell, who's a Liberty's head coach right now, previously at Coastal Carolina, who was absolutely balling out, built up a ton of equity, put a tweet that said the, his location was in Starkville, Mississippi, out about Liberty. It's You, you know how it, it, it works on the internet. Um, hmm. But I would make Jamie Chadwell tell me no. Really? I would make Jamie Chadwell tell me no. a good fit there? No. Yeah, I think he's a really good fit. I think Jamie's a good fit anywhere where they let you play with 11 guys. On each side of the ball in the field's 100 yards long and 53 and a third yards wide. I would make Jamie Chadwell tell me no. And to be honest with you, if I'm Jamie Chadwell, I'm telling you no. 
Mm. I've built up too much equity. And, and, and people like Billy Napier played it right. I don't know how it's going to end in Florida, but he built up all that equity, you know, called Sunbelt Billy, could have taken some, some not small jobs, but not the, the highest of the high, waits and he gets Florida. Kirby Smart could have taken a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs when he was at DC at Georgia or DC at Alabama. Bided his time, waited his time, perfect job opened up, his alma mater, Georgia, boom, you take it. I think Jamie's waiting on that. And at Liberty, you're making almost four million, buddy. There's a ski resort on campus. They got as much, they got that long money, got that church money at Liberty. It goes a long way, a real long way. So Jamie Chadwell doesn't have to go, you know, reaching for anything right now. I'd make him tell me no. And then when he does tell me no, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going out to UNLV, and I'm telling Barry Odom, Odom and Brendan Marion, bring that go-go offense. Let's come over here to Mississippi State and let's get this thing rock and rolling. Barry Odom has experience as a head coach in the SEC. It wasn't fantastic, right? But uh, when he was at Missouri, but it wasn't just uh, off a cliff either. I think he's he's learned from it. The second time, you're typically better. Uh, and then we saw what he did as DC at Arkansas. You know, he knows the lay of the land. He gets it. He's turned UNLV into something that is uh, that has shocked me. Mm-hmm. Has shocked me. Watch him. It's a fun offense. I think it's a really good fit for Mississippi State. So that's what I'd do. Mississippi State won nine games in Mike Leach's last year there. They hadn't won 10 games since Dan Mullen's fifth year, something like that. What do you think? Do y'all think they're too quick to pull the trigger on Zach Arnett? We always sit up here and talk about coaches need three years. Yeah. Right? Well, They gave the the guy 11 games. Less than a year. Well, well, here's, look, (laughs) the circumstance is different. Mm -hmm. Like, this wasn't a... You know what? We fired our coach because we're going to get this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This wasn't a, our coach went to the NFL. This is our next guy. He needs time. The head coach died. Mike Leach passed away. They elevated Zach Arnett. There was a ton of emotion around the bowl. You remember, he got him up to play the bowl game, you know, and, and finish the year right. And all the players were like, hey, man, let's ride with Coach Arnett. And you, you, so, and you never know. You never know what can happen at the end of the day. But, but it, Watching it, I can understand, and when you look at the contract, this is why they were smart on the front end, because it is business at the end of the day. I think it was the right move. I don't think Zach is fully ready yet at a place like Mississippi State. You, and let's think about this. You didn't just get the head job at like Southeast Louisiana yeah. and work your way. Your first head job was Mississippi State because your boss passed away kind of out of nowhere. So I think we got to make sure the circumstance is if I'm going to get my guy with Billy Napier, I need three. I need three years. And Ford is not going to fire Billy after this year because they're not going to bring in a guy, if they did want to get rid of him, to have to go bash his head against the wall against that schedule in 2024. They'd much rather let Billy run this play out through 2024 than see if he either turns it around or you can eat that bad schedule and then bring in the new guy for 2025 to not you know, walk in and get hit with a baseball bat right in the groin because of who you're playing in year one without your guys and your best roster there. Fair enough. Oh. I think I think two names I would look at for sure. I'd look at Jeff Levy from Oklahoma. I think Levy. I think it's time for Levy to get a head coaching job. I think he's only proven. Would it. Jeff take that? That's the question. I mean, if you want to be a head coach, yeah, I'd take that Mississippi State job. Well, how like like I, I just I don't know with Jeff how bad like like it, it. You're building something with Brent out there, right? You're going to the SEC the next year. Do you just go ahead and jump and say, all right? If you want me to be the Mississippi State head coach, I'll be the Mississippi State head coach. And I'm not trying to sit here and downplay Mississippi State. All right? They've unbelievably loyal fan base. Starkville, it's you know, a lot of people make fun of Starkville. I have no problem with Starkville. I know they're not the biggest team in the SEC, but I got a lot of respect for Mississippi State. I'm not saying that they're just, you know, whatever, like it's Georgia State. But I think if Jeff Levy co- comes to the SEC, balls out once again, like he did at Ole Miss under Lane Kiffin, Right? And he's at his alma mater in Oklahoma. Do you not think you get a bigger job than that? Or it could backfire, and you don't have Dylan Gabriel next year. Oh. You come in and play SEC defense. Well, l- well, well. To me, to me, if I'm Jeff Levy, I mean, you, what's going on with Chip Kelly mm. at UCLA? I'd much rather. I know they're going to the Big Ten. Go out there to go to UCLA and be the head coach there 
and be the head coach of Mississippi State. I, I would. That's me. That's my opinion. I don't know about Jeff. All right, next one up here. More details continue to emerge with this uh, hockey situation. A couple of weeks ago, we broke down this unfortunate um, incident where Adam Johnson had his had his uh, throat cut uh, during play. Mm, this was man. over in England. Now, a man has been arrested on suspicion of manslaughter over the death of ice hockey player Adam Johnson. We have to assume this is Matt Petgrave, but, yeah. you know, again, one thing we have to understand is this is British law. So all this is a little bit different in terms of how the details emerge. And also, like, they're manslaughter laws. Like, they, they're going to be different than what they are here. Also, another thing that I heard, and this was from uh, our, our boy Rhino, is the cheering that you saw from the fans at the hockey game that emerged earlier this week. Um, those fan, That video was cut in a weird way, and people who were at the game were saying this, that the fans were just cheering when the when the team came out or the video was coming out. So it was that like a coincidence. photo happened to, like, be up there or something when they were cheering for the team coming on the ice. That's just the latest that I heard about the situation. Yeah, and and look, if, if people are there, we're saying that. That's why I thought that video was so weird yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't make sense of, like, I even told Reed, my wife, that she's like, well, was there, like, a memorial for the player that had passed away? And they were, you know, whatever, whatever. But why is that guy's picture on the board? Like, to me, I just, it's, it's a really weird situation. So they arrested a man, which... You know, we know what assuming does, but we all saw the video. The reason that he's no longer alive is he took a skate to the neck. So we can make a pretty good estimation on who was taking in for it. And you know what? I don't know what the manslaughter laws are, uh, are in England. I, I don't know how it goes down over there. I just know they wear funny wigs and when they walk in the courtroom. That's about it. That's all I know. And Mel Gibson kicked their ass. Those are the two things. But when I look at this, to me, it is manslaughter. That was, I've had more people reach out to me, and I tweeted the video yesterday that, that we put out. I had more hockey guys message me, DM me, and say, listen, I have played hockey since I was four years old. Mm -hmm. That was not a hockey move. It just wasn't. And it's consistent across the board. I'm not saying that oh boy was like, I'm about to murder this guy. Sure. I'm, th that's not what I'm saying. I think he had a dirty play that resulted in somebody losing their life with a sharp blade skate. To, to, to me, that's manslaughter. Yeah, and just remember, over, at least over here, when it comes to manslaughter, intent doesn't play into that. It's, it's reckless behavior, which, you know, look, a lot of your job when you're playing ice hockey is to be reckless, especially if you're a certain type of player. So that's why this case is particularly interesting to me because one way or another, whether he's convicted or found innocent, it's going to sort of influence precedent, I think, for major sports moving forward. And another conversation that we were having with some of the guys here is the Tony Stewart racing incident that happened many years ago. Now, this wasn't on a NASCAR track. This was like a smaller circuit when he was racing and, and bumped a guy off, off of the racetrack. That guy got out and got on the track and was like coming over to Tony Stewart. Weird situation happened where he ramped up, tried to go by him. That guy died. Uh, I think there was some sort of investigation. Tony Stewart obviously wasn't prosecuted. He raced for a long time. Different because that guy went on the track, but still it's comparable. Well, well I think it like, should Miles Garrett be in jail? No. No. That's assault with a deadly weapon. That's what that is. You, I mean, there definitely could have been. If, if that, now, battery. if he would have made contact with, and here's where, you know, it's just life is life. If he would have made contact with Mason Rudolph, speaking about Miles Garrett, and he would have severely injured him, then yes. Right? You could that's still get that's, assault, though. That's assault. No, that, right? that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. I'm agreeing with you then. I, I'm agreeing with you then. No, but I mean, if he makes contact, it's then battery, right? Yeah. But yeah. If you even get close and miss, you could be charged with a I, it's, I, I The think league didn't want that. The league didn't want that. Like, they would have to, it would have to end, result in an injury. It'd be like this, is if a play ended and somebody was pissed and you're just waiting around for the next play and there is a blatant, like, blindside hit mm -hmm. where somebody comes in, not during the play, but after the play, that results in somebody getting paralyzed or somebody dying. To me, that's manslaughter. That's reckless behavior, right? That, that, I, would, I would agree with that, too. Just like this, was reckless behavior that was used to intent to hurt somebody. Not, oh, it was bang, bang on the sideline. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we're about to get in the huddle, mm -hmm. like, and you, and you come out and take somebody out. So I, I think this is a... Um, Don't be surprised if this one gets talked about for a long time. For sure. Because like you said, it will set precedent. Sports will it will precedent, set precedent. For sure. Um, college basketball, I want to talk about a little bit. Kansas held off Kentucky yesterday in, in a big matchup. I mean, Hunter Dickinson... We have 27 and 21. Mm, uh, best Dickinson since Emily. Yeah, exactly. So that was 89-84, Kansas over Kentucky. And then Duke with a big win over Michigan State, 
Yeah, you know, um, look, I, I'm very interested to see how John Shire does at Duke now that Coach K's not there. It's really weird kind of what like what we're seeing in college basketball. Like I watch Syracuse, I don't see Jim Beheim. You know, I watch Duke, I don't see Coach K. Even now, with I know Hubert Davis has been at North Carolina, you know, for for a couple of years. It's still weird not seeing Roy Williams over there. I mean, the only one that I really recognize now is Bill Self. Uh, and also RIP to Bobby Knight. We lost him earlier um, this month, one of one of the GOATs. But yeah, it's I always caution fans of college basketball and, and in general, this is for any sport in general, do not jump off a cliff or get too excited early in the season. Because nobody at this point last year was like, no doubt, FAU. <laughs> FAU San Diego State Final Four. Mm-hmm. No doubt. It's it's getting to the tournament and playing well when you get into the tournament. Uh, you like to see what you have, obviously, in these games. Win or lose. You know, you want to win every game you play, obviously. It helps you out with RPI. It helps you out with seeding into the tournament. But playing these big-time early games gives you great experience to get you ready for conference play, to get you ready for that stretch run. Always love seeing it. I'm just glad I haven't seen anybody play on an aircraft carrier yet. Those games just did, just the weather just would not work out. Like it just basketball's it, not meant to be played outside. You're, yeah, no, at the rec. That's where, at the rec and in prison. Yeah, that's where basketball should be played. Double outside. rims shouldn't exist. Yep. you shouldn't play basketball outside. God, you're, you're just spitting facts right now. Preach. Just absolutely spitting facts. All right, we're going to get to uh, our best bets here in a second. But first, I need to let you guys know, you know what's the best bet of all time? Taking care of your skin. All right, Bye. taking care of your body. And our friends Thanks over at Janie Cell, they cracked the code. All right, Thanksgiving's just one week away. All right, just in time for the holidays. We already told you about the great offer we had earlier. Janie Cell is offering their best sale of the year. This is a true story. Okay, this is not made up. Right now, you can get 70% off. All right, you heard that right. Not seven. Not five, 70% off, which means it's more free than it's not, of GenuCell's most popular package, which includes the GenuCell 3, their newest under-eye treatment. Genu- uh, it'll have you looking 10, 15, even 20 years younger. All right, you can say goodbye to fine lines, crow's feet, under-eye bags, and dark spots. It's for men and women. Our producer, Justine, loves it. She uses the under-eye cream, right? And I'm sh- looking good. Mm-hmm. Looking good, PJ. Wanted to tell Thanks, you that. Guys. Could tell this morning. All right, we got to meet the founder of GenuCell last week. You and know. his story is really, really His cool. life will be a movie. Yes, it will. It's, it's unbelievably sat right in that chair that Blaine's sitting in and told us it is, I'm telling you, it's, it's a really cool company. They have fantastic products. The Booster Club bought them out last time. So go to GenuCell.com slash Booster. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Booster to get this incredible holiday discount for 70% off their most popular package. It includes the GenuCell 3 and the Dark Spot Corrector. You get results in 12 hours or less. The immediate effects are included for free. That's GenuCell.com slash booster for 70% off today plus free priority shipping. GenuCell.com slash booster. Fantastic product. So let's get off my lawn, David. One of my favorite oh, products. Are you ready for that? Oh, yeah. yeah so that. G off David's lawn. Yeah. Nice try. Get I can't wait to it. see this one. Look at the ears on this guy. Had fun. I could hear you from a mile away. Goodness gracious. Uh, all right. Every Wednesday, my nine foot tall colleague who's really 883 trapped in a 35 year old's body. Has somebody G and off his L for everybody to see. David, who's slowly approaching you, looking you in the eyes and G and off your L today? I think you know. Tony Petiti needs to get off my lawn. Tony Petiti. The Big Ten Conference may have a new commissioner this year, but its modus operandi remains the same, and that is panicking under pressure. We are only three summers removed from COVID, a time when the Big Ten elected to prematurely cancel its football season with little to no due diligence, thus paving the way for Greg Sankey and the SEC to fill that leadership void and save college football. The Southeastern Conference laughed at the Big Ten then, and they're laughing again now. After Commissioner Petiti moved to suspend Michigan coach Jim Harbaugh while he was on a plane with his team 20 hours before playing their biggest game of the season. And before the conference attempts to pound its chest and take up some moral high ground, remember, this is the same organization that asserted no authority and issued no penalty for over a year as allegations broke of child molestation at Penn State. But when an analyst allegedly goes to watch a football game in person, that receives punishment within weeks in the most cowardly fashion and without the conference conducting an investigation. Now, for some, the facts never mattered. Like Michigan homers and Michigan haters, they're dug in. But most of us would love to know the facts. What violations occurred, who is responsible, what evidence exists, and what's the appropriate punishment? Instead, the conference, the media, and the NCAA tried Harbaugh in the court of public opinion and punished him without due process. Americans see through that. 
You attempted to vilify a guy who opens press conferences by talking about raising chickens, and instead you martyrized him. That's why Harbaugh labeled this America's team. He's calling your troll job and raising you. And Paul Feinbaum, the next time you want to call Michigan fans the most obnoxious in the country, well, that one's, that one's tough to argue with, but <laughs> let me try again. F- Feinbaum, the next time you want to call Jim Harbaugh the Darth Vader of college football, just remember, Vader redeems himself by destroying Palpatine, the evil emperor who shares a striking resemblance with, <laughs> you know what, never mind. Y'all just stay off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> That's great oh, stuff, David. It, look, I'm, look, there's a like there. I'm not going to lie, man. It's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> Which one? I love how everybody calls Darth Vader. They're like, man, yeah, he's like Darth Vader. Darth Vader ends up being ends up being a good guy. Well, he again. did. You kill a bunch of women and kids. So I don't know if you, it's kind of hard. We don't talk about that it's part. It's kind of hard to come back from that. I don't know. There's been a lot of world Is that not a striking a resemblance? Hey, look at like this. Pull that back up. Like, th- there is some. You put a black hood <laughs> over Paul Feinbaum. And if, if he walked in and electricity started coming out of his fingertips, I wouldn't be shocked. And look, I got we got tons of respect for Paul Feinbaum here. But we can also sit here and say... You the look man, like Senator Palpatine. The man looks like Palpatine. I still think most of the country's torn on this. I think people are like, okay, it's becoming more and more obvious that Michigan violated some sort of rule, and with that should come some sort of punishment, regardless if it's selective enforcement. I think we can all get behind that idea, but there's a large swath of this country now that says, wait, we've been seeing this the past two years. Y'all doing all this stuff without due process, without your due diligence. Mm -hmm. We're tired of it. Like, people are tired. I'm sick of talking about it, to be honest. I feel like that's all we've talked about the last couple weeks, just Michigan stuff. And I'm like, look, y'all are letting guys play the women's sports, but y'all get mad at sending about a guy to a football game? Yeah. That was another one I had in the Big Ten. They had a a Michigan swimmer uh, set Big Ten records in women's swimming who was a male. No suspension there. Yeah, and Paul. Didn't intervene then. Paul wants to talk about morality and being good. Dog, you work for that network. You gotta tell me about what's good, like what you should do. How about you criticize your own network if you uh, criticize Michigan like they're the devil? No, it's uh, it's it's very interesting uh, story to follow, but that's a uh, that's a good comparison there, David. I like that. All right, we're gonna get to bets in one second. Push uh, quickly. All right, let's get to Tyler Jarvis, five dollar donation. Appreciate it, T Jarv. What happens if Michigan or Ohio wins out? Bama wins out and wins the SEC. Oregon wins out, wins the Pac-12, and Texas and FSU wins out. Well, oh, FSU, FSU wins out. They're going undefeated. They're, they're getting in. And Michigan or Ohio State wins out. They're going to be in. Uh, that's that's a scenario that I said, right? That's the same one I, I what, had? Say Where you have three one-loss teams between Oregon, Texas, and Alabama, and then two undefeated teams. From Big with, Ten and ACC? With, with, Big Ten, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With uh, Michigan State and then Florida State from the ACC? Mm. Yeah. I mean, to me, I mean, Texas got to be in, right? Because you have the tiebreaker over Bama. So then it becomes Oregon and, and Texas. Got to put Texas in. So now it becomes Oregon or Alabama. That's what the committee does not want. That's the death lineup. Let's go to Ben Johnson. What's up, Ben? Hashtag Ask Cranico. Why is Oklahoma State still ranked after their blowout loss to UCF? Um, look, I, I, here's, here's my real question. I'm not worried about Oklahoma State or any of these teams that really aren't going to be in the end. When are we going to put James Madison in here, man? Like, can you see that, like, the NCAA, it doesn't let – can't win your conference. Can't play in a bowl game. Mm-hmm. You can't even rank them in the playoff committee. They're undefeated. They're 10 and 0. Who does that hurt? Yeah. Like, I, I know there's some weight to, oh, well, where you rank ends up, what, what bowl game you play in. They, put them in the rankings. I said I didn't want salmon. I said it like four times. I was going to G hurt. It says several things can be true at once. Michigan deserves due process. Mm-hmm. The SEC and five bombs shouldn't be the arbiter of. Uh, ethical sports behavior. Yes. And three, Michigan fans need to stop acting like Jim Harbaugh died. Yeah. <laughs> Fair All across those are the true. board. Fair across the Jared, board. Jared, I'm 100% with you. <laughs> All right, let's go to Aiden Loss. What's up, Aiden? He says, I'm not a Michigan fan. I'm a Michigan Tech, Tech fan. fan. Yes. Yeah. Michigan fans aren't bad. Other schools are just jealous. Their fan bases aren't as good. I am also jealous. I'm just not salty. About it. How is Michigan Tech doing? This? Yeah, we need a, Aiden. Question. We need a Michigan Tech update. There, uh, where's their? We got the the puck too. Right? Where's the pennant? We'll find it. It's I'm, I I was I think I showed it to somebody who came in the studio the other day. I was going to Taylor Russell. He says Michigan got caught red red handed. Get over it, Michigan fans, and deal with your punishment. Which is what? Is it just a three game suspension of Harbaugh? Well, I just this would never ha- you this would never happen in Alabama. No, that you think they'd point. suspend They're Nick laughing. Saban for three They're games? They're laughing at the big. That, well, not only that, that right. not only would it never happen in the SEC. And look, I'm an SEC guy. I'm the first one to tell you. Y'all know me, all right? But like the SEC's like bad. 
That's bad Michigan. You guys are cheating. They're like, hey, do we got the we got the signs for? If it's uh, me, I'm as quiet as possible about it. Oh, for no, you'll never know. Well, I'm never. I'm pretending like it didn't happen. We're focused on us. Well, the hearing is scheduled for this Friday, which Jim Harbaugh yeah. said he's going to go to. Which do we? We don't by chance have the, the, the Judge Harbaugh Judy and Judge Judy clip, do we? No, oh, what an Easter egg! What an Easter egg! I, I think was, I sent it, it to PJ yesterday. yesterday. If you if you have it back there. Yeah, pull yeah. It in there it's because. so fun. The look on his face is like a kid at Disney World. But it's like, you know, if I'm the SEC, it reminds me of like of the episode from Eastbound and Down when Kenny Powers is like the PE teacher for the first time. And that kid's like, he's like, does anybody have any questions? And the kid's like, yeah, my dad said you ruined baseball. And he's like, listen, uh, he's like, your dad's wrong. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to say the other thing he said. He said, but listen, um, I can already tell I'm not going to like you regardless of how many push-ups or pull-ups you can do. So if anybody wants to pick on anyone, that's the kid, because I, I ain't looking. If I'm the SEC, I'm like, hey, if y'all want to pick on Michigan, go ahead. But I ain't looking. I'm not a pining or anything like that. We're just going to move yeah. along. But speaking of moving along, best bets for this weekend. I got one, boys. I don't like using terms lock of the year. Say absolute before it. Our, our lock of the century. Oh, yeah. really? Our oh. greatest possibly greatest bet i've ever seen like it's already hit i don't want to put the cart the horse in front of the cart you did you okay just did all right but i'm looking at this oklahoma ttp you know me over 39 and a half is going off at minus 135 you can get over 40 and a half at minus 125 over 41 and a half minus 105 over 41 and a half with this BYU defense, all right, that, for lack of a better term, looks like a bunch of insurance salesmen running around trying to tackle people. And that was last week against Iowa State. And I know Iowa State's playing better, but they're not the Globetrotters, buddy. They ain't the Warriors. But BYU made them look like the greatest show on turf. I was just waiting to see young Kurt Warner go out there with, with the rest of the gang and, and you know, ma- making plays left and right. I am going to go ahead and lock in. Over 41 and a half at minus 105 for one of my show bets. And I think you should take that bet. BYU last three games, right? It's not just offense with Slovis that's out. And they had, with Slovis out, we'll see if he plays this week. They're going three and out a lot, which means the defense is on the field a lot. Against Texas, gave up 35, lost 35 to 6. At West Virginia, gave up 37, lost 37 to 7. At home versus Iowa State, Gave up 45, lost 45 to 13. And now Jeff Levy and Rufio and the boys are coming into town, coming into Provo. Buddy, give me the TTP all day, Blaine. All day. One game I'm in love with is the Michigan-Maryland over. At really? And a half. You watch a Penn State team drop 50-plus on a Maryland football team. And if Penn State can do it, Michigan might score 120 points. It's sitting at 19 and a half. I kind of like that spread, too. I think Michigan wants to throw the ball a little bit uh, around after they didn't throw a pass in the second half. And I love the the Northwestern Purdue uh, under. It's sitting at 46 and a half right now. Mm. There's no way. There's no way. I watch both these teams play. Purdue maybe can freak out sometimes, but I don't think its Northwestern team can score. Um, and I really, I'm, I'm really in love with this under. I think you should take that. And Georgia, minus 10 and a half. That buds. See. Pay me. Bet buds. Pay me all the money. Mine said a half. Would you not buy that down to nine and a half though, just to cover? I your mean, ass? you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you would, but I don't think it's going to be that close. Um, if anything, I'd buy this game up. Like I, Georgia, thirteen and a half. I believe in it. What? Like, look, I understand Tennessee's at home. Tennessee will get up for this game, but everyone gets up to play Georgia. Mm-hmm. All right, everybody does it. Everybody believes until they kick the ball off. All right, it might be Georgia might be up seven or 10 in the first half, but the second half Georgia team is just built different. I don't that, trust Joe Milton. That body's different when it comes to Georgia. I think Georgia rolls in this game. I wrote that one down as well. I also like, did you talk about the Iowa-Illinois under? I don't care what game? it is, take it. Iowa, yeah, is Illinois Iowa playing? Under, take 30, the under. 30 and a half, I like that one. Colorado's plus four and a half. Uh, at Washington State. Now, remember, Washington Washington State started 4-0, beat Wisconsin, beat Oregon State, and then they have lost six in a row since then. I'm not sure what's happened out there, but if you can get Colorado, who's been playing teams close even in their losses, uh, I like the four and a half points there when they go to to Washington State. And then... um, Oregon minus 23 is one that I put down, and the Kansas, Kansas State over 50. Doesn't Oregon have Arizona State this week? Mm-hmm. <sighs> I know. Dilly's just been. It's Dilly been, and them just find a which way around to cover football they, games. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you another one. West Virginia at home against Cincinnati. It's down to minus six and a half. 
to West Virginia. I love the way they're playing. I know, um, you know, last weekend wasn't great for them, but I love the way this offense has blossomed. Neil Brown has saved his job. I don't think Cincinnati can score enough points. And I think West I know Donaldson got hurt last week. I hated to see that for them. Uh, but I love West Virginia at home to be able to cover this basically touchdown and set minus six and a half. Another one I was kind of peeking at, guys, I, is this the weekend where I just say, screw it, I don't care who it is, I don't care where it is, I'm going to take Liberty and James Madison to cover. Like my only, my only hold Wagon. up is I picked against App State last weekend who went on the road and just smoked Georgia State. Mm. I was shocked by that, uh, honestly. But I was too. you're going to a pissed off James Madison who they won't rank in the college football playoff ranking, who can't make a bowl, who can't win the conference. Uh, you know, coach, hey, let me like this, Signetti. I is, do think they lost their the sack leader on their defense for the year. I thought it was the running back who they lost. Okay, I might be wrong. I, 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 I don't know, man. That. Just th- This team, they're minus nine at home. That, that went down from minus 10, I believe, uh, or 10 and a half from yesterday uh, against App State Home. And then Liberty is playing UMass. They're a 27 and a half point favorite at home. Um, I mean, why, why would I not ride? Why would I not no, ride? No, look, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to ride with James Madison. They're an absolute wagon this year. I mean, I think another one we can look at, Iowa State plus seven and a half. You like that? At home versus a Texas team with Jonathan Brooks out. ACL, he's done for the year. Yeah, I like Quinn that. Quinn Ewers looks banged up. The offense did not look the same, especially in the second half of the TCU game. That one. And why would I take Bama minus 45 and a half against Chattanooga? Rumor has it you may be giving Chattanooga a game speech. It's oh, be a, yeah. A slaughtering. I mean, like, Bama will slip up and accidentally beat them by 60. You know, the third strings at Bama are better than the starters at Chattanooga. So it doesn't matter who the— What you get worried about is you put Ty Simpson in and that other GA from Notre Dame. Like, <laughs> you put those guys in, then it gets weird, right? Then it gets weird. But I like Bama minus 40. 40. Hey, hey, David, David. Rutgers and Penn State, the over-under is 41. Those two offenses— it's like watching ugly people kiss, man. Well, like, I what was thinking that when I was thinking, will, will Penn State come out and score a lot of points? Because they've been doing that against teams. Well, Rutgers pretty good on league, defense. But then they fired their offensive coordinator. Yeah. So I don't Which, I mean. Right. I don't know. Does that solve it or does that make it worse? I, I know. Ask the Arkansas fans. They thought Kenny Guyton was the, was the reincarnation of Christ when he mm-hmm. came in and after what he did at Florida. What about North Carolina plus seven at Clemson? Man, this game. God. I don't that's know a, who North Carolina is. For North Carolina. I, I don't know who North Carolina is. Like, I thought halfway through this year, I was like, all right, defense is, is better, which it is better. Couldn't get a lot worse from what it was last year. Defense is better. Going to be able to stay in it. Drake made. Now you got Tez Walker back. Like, North Carolina's going to be cooking. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're fighting to beat App State. You're holding on to beat a Duke team without Riley Leonard. You're, you're regressing back to the mean defensively a little bit like Oklahoma had been, right? I just... I mean, Clemson's a seven-point favorite? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, favorite. Yep. Six and a half, seven point. God, do you like the over in this game? What's it at? 50-something. i will be 50-something. Let, have me, to let me see. That's a, that's a good question. Right now, 58? Yeah. Mm. God. A lot of points. I don't know. I, I, almost, I almost want to see. If you're calling in, we want to know what your best bet is. Right? I, I want to know if somebody's got yeah. just an absolute fire starter here. Because this weekend... There's some good lines that are out. Not my favorite one. Not, not my favorite weekend to bet, David. But uh, I don't know. That's that's all all I saw yesterday, and and all I saw right now that I'm just I'm in love with. I, I don't know if, if there's any you know the Georgia Tennessee when we can go back and forth. Notre Dame's 24 and a half point favorite. LSU LSU minus 31. Like, what so. whatever the TTP is. GSU. Whatever the TTP is. They're gonna they're gonna score. Jordan they'll State. score 50. Yeah. Not GSU. It's a whole different place. Yeah, he's just a kid from Statesboro, Road man. Southern. Make sure you show respect. Sure, it's not GSU. Don't make me come over there. Mm. Okay. Beautiful. All right, let's get to calls. Hunter in Arkansas. Hunter, talk to us. Good morning, boys. What's up, man? To you. It, this is weird because I'm not really a fan of this team, but I kind of want to talk about them because they actually have a weirdly good record. I wasn't expecting it. The Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, the Steelers. How, they, how have they won six games? It's been ugly. It has been ugly. It's been really ugly. I was actually, I was actually, when I was watching them play this weekend, and I saw five and three, um, I was actually kind of taken aback because you would think the way it's been going. I mean, you've beaten the Packers, you've beaten the Titans, you've beaten the Rams, you've beaten the Ravens, you've beaten the Browns and the Raiders. So it's not like you've beaten the best teams in the world, but it's not like you've beaten the worst teams in the world. I just think they're. A, a little bit above average. Four and one since that blowout loss yeah. in Houston. 
Look, Mike Tomlin, he's he's going to find a way oh, to win yeah. games. They're not going to sit here and just consistently lay eggs. But we had a Steelers fan call in who was you know, kind of upset about the way it was going. Well, now you go to Cleveland and Cincinnati back-to-back. That ought to be interesting, especially with that Browns defense. But the Steelers, man, they're sneaky. Well, I'm just not thing. sold on Kenny Pickett, man. Pittsburgh is the only team in the past 90 years to have a winning record through eight games despite being outgained in every game so far. So magic. Wow. That's the answer. Artage wise, it's it's. And there's another stat too that I saw. I have to go find. It just blows my mind. You got outgained in every game. Every game. And what you're six and three. Mm-hmm. How does that happen? TJ Watt. I say to me, they feel like a poor man's like Dallas Cowboys because like I think they have the same record, and it's one superstar defensive player carrying each team. It's just. Dallas actually has offense. Yeah, well, I mean, they need to start getting George Pickens more involved. Like, I mean, at it, some at some point, I know there were some rumblings out of Pittsburgh this past week that yeah, George isn't happy. Yeah, that George isn't exactly thrilled with the way that it's he wears going. his emotions on his sleeve. If you watch George play, he did the same thing at Georgia. Yeah, for sure. Um, but now it's going to be interesting to see down the stretch, Hunter. That's for Dag, I'm sure. Thanks for calling, man. All right, let's go to Cade in Idaho. Cade, what's, what's up, on? Cade? Hi, uh, this is Bronco Spud. What's, What's up, up dog? Avalos, Gonzo, huh? Yeah, like I said, it should have happened, but a little too late. Uh, we're sitting at a 5-5, five and five, and I just have a question because I'm a little confused. Boise State, if they get six wins, is that a winning season? Is that considered a winning season or no? Well, look, I think, uh, you know, technically, I, I guess it's considered a, a push if, if we want to be honest. But Boise State has raised the standard so much there uh, that, that I don't think that's a successful season for them. And I don't think Boise State fans should oh. think that's a successful season for them. It's not successful, but I don't want our streak to end. We haven't oh, had not, a losing season since yeah. 1997. Yeah. Oh, well, this would certainly count for that. Yeah, like you, you wouldn't. You to me, I like mean, if you go six. Like you may not be able to get in on calling it a winning season, but you for sure didn't have a losing. season. Well, to me, it's it's almost like when when you push with the dealer in blackjack. Yeah, right. Like it's a push. I, I didn't win money, but I did bowl game. Lose to fight money, another day. Carries over. Carries. I over. mean, you went seven and five in twenty twenty one. You went ten and four in twenty twenty two. In twenty twenty, you went. Casco, you went five and two. So I mean. You went seven and five two years ago, so it's nothing really crazy if you do go what six wins. Well, it's I, again. I, I think Boise State seven and five should be the the anomaly. I, I don't think it's something that should should become a pattern. And, and I know time moves on, and we've had conference realignment. And there's been a lot of movement, and you know this isn't back in the days where oh boy was you know throwing throwing uh, hook and ladders and proposing to his cheerleader girlfriend after you beat Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl or whatever it was. But Boise State to me, when I think of Group of Five. Boise State is the one of the top that I think about yeah. still. Still, I mean, look, we walked through when I was coaching in Montana. We walked through on that blue turf. That stadium's legit. Like that's a legit, big time college football atmosphere stadium. Uh, so yeah, I hold Boise State in a higher regard. But no, it would not ruin the win- the uh, consecutive winning season streak. Okay, and I just want to talk about how Avalos. 21 and 14, that was his record. Yep. At, at Boise State. And there are people to this day still defending him in the Boise, in, amongst Boise State fans. Yeah, and you'll have that. Uh, you'll have that. But let, let me ask you this, Cade. Who, who, who replaces him? To be entirely honest, this will never happen, but I want Coach Pete back. It'll never happen. Yeah, I bet y'all. Uh, I know a guy. I know a guy y'all can call. Yeah, Blaine knows a guy. Not, do not bring up Parson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 69 and 19. 69 and 19 at Boise State. Look, do you guys want to be accountable I and mean, lift look, weights? Man, look, how much do you like incline bench and power clean? You know, that's what I'm talking about. Huddle up, guys. We might win eight games. <laughs> his son his son has already signed with us. He's yeah, his son's a good player. His son's a good look, player. This is, that's yeah. gives another incentive. Look, it's again, yeah. Add it to the list. Add it to the list of reasons why, but... Kay, we always love when you call, buddy. Appreciate it, Kay. Thank oh, you, Kay. I have one bet. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. well, give us Ooh, one. Let me hear so, it. So, I don't – the line hasn't opened up, uh, but Idaho State against Idaho, if that line opens up, take Idaho State to cover. 
Okay, okay. gotcha. Gotcha. They have, been, they have been amazing at covering this. Okay. Year. And they okay. covered their win, their win. Vandal, baby. Good to know. No, Idaho's the Vandals. Dang. Idaho State is like uh, the candles, the, the potato <laughs> boys, the PBs, the bagels. Love it. Love Appreciate it. it. Appreciate it, Kate. Thank you, man. All right, let's go to John in Mobile, Alabama. Mm. John, John, what's up? The most elite trail in sports media. Good morning. Hi what's up, brother? How's it going? Thank you, John. I'm well, thanks. Hey, uh, real quick, I want to say, David, leave Paul Feinbaum alone. He's a national treasure. We love that man. <laughs> All so right, give well, him a break, okay? We, you we you keep, keep out the way he looks. You keep loving him. I'm going to pass. Hashtag unsubscribe. <laughs> So uh, the college football Playoff committee finally got it right, putting my Georgia Bulldogs at number one yesterday. Yeah. And I wanted to come on first and say that uh, the great uh, Timmy B, uh, who I have all the respect in the world for, had a take yesterday that I completely disagree with, and that is mm. that Oregon is playing the best ball out of anybody in college football right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just don't believe that that's true. When you go uh, into your home stadium – and get held to 10 points below your uh, season average by a USC defense that's ranked in the hundreds somewhere in total defense. That doesn't scream best ball to me. Um, it's, you know, with the last two weeks in the books, Georgia beaten two top 15 teams, uh, one of which, you know, convincingly, certainly, you got to say that Georgia's playing the best ball right now. So, uh, respect to Tim Brando, but uh, you're just wrong on that one, sir. Yeah, uh, John, I, I'll say this. Um, I actually agree with you. I think Georgia is is playing as good, if not better, than anybody right now. I think there's a couple teams that you can make a case for. I think you could make a a slight case for Oregon. I think what what you know Oregon's strength is 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 they play complementary football, right? They, they're good in all three phases: special teams, offense, and defense. But so is Georgia. Hell, I think you can make an argument that Alabama's playing better than anybody in the country right now and, and sure. be able to say it. I think you can make an argument that Michigan is playing as, as good as anybody in the country. But you know what I like the most, John, that, about the whole situation you just brought up? Is that we can actually make that argument about multiple teams this year. I'm glad we can actually have this conversation instead of saying, you know what? Well, here they are. And I know as a Georgia fan, you may not love this because it's been y'all the past two years. But here's this one team. Everybody else is trying to catch them. They probably won't catch them, but we have a legitimate argument and a legitimate conversation going into week 12 of the college football season where more teams can win the national championship or more teams can make a logical argument that they're playing better than anybody right now. You could say Florida State, in my opinion, too, as crazy as that sounds. I know they only beat Miami by seven, uh, but I think there's some ways you can make that argument. I'm just glad we're able to have that argument. And as far as the Oregon not scoring a lot, I think the way that game was going with the way both those teams kind of played, I know Oregon only scored, you know, seven points in the third and the fourth quarter, but it seemed to me like they were trying to keep Caleb Williams off the field because they kept that mm -hmm. lead and, and kind of kept it there. They were snapping the ball under 12 seconds in the play clock to go pretty much the whole game. And then USC on the other side wasn't going super fast because their defense was on the field the whole time. And if you remember, Oregon scored two touchdowns in the first six plays. So I think there was a little bit of gamesmanship there, but I'm with you. I would not put Oregon number one in the country right now. Right. Well, it, I mean, it, all the parody in college football is all just a mirage. Georgia's going to be on the mountaintop at the end, but uh, <laughs> I got a, a playoff scenario very similar to the one that you brought up earlier, Jay, yeah. with three teams vying for two spots. Um, in a situation where Florida State wins out, Michigan or Ohio State wins out, take your pick, and uh, Georgia wins out. Um, let's say that Texas and Oregon uh, both win out uh, facing Oklahoma and Washington mm. in the uh, championship game for their conferences, respectively. And let's say the margins of victory from here to the end of the year are all within a couple of points of the point spread. So there's no uh, you know close calls and there's no blowouts. When you've got two teams in Texas and Oregon sitting at 12 and one with conference championships who um, get uh, a, a win over the only team that beat them in the regular season, who are you going to put in the playoff at that point? Mm. Cause you don't have uh, a real clear cut uh, solution there with a common opponent or anything between Texas and Oregon. So it comes down to what it comes down to Oregon and Texas with mm -hmm. one loss is what you're saying. That's what for that last spot. Correct. And, 
Yeah. And, and you know, Oregon beats Washington, their only regular season loss, and Texas beats Oklahoma, their only regular season loss. Each one of them is going to have a few top 25 wins at that point. Mm-hmm. Who's going to get, if that happens, huh. which I think is, is likely, who do you put into that fourth spot? It'll be That's Oregon. Or, It'll be, Oregon. Well, It'll be, be Oregon. It'll be Oregon. common record opponent. Yeah, and it's tough because Texas has the best win, right? And then even maybe even strength the schedule. But, but, does, but does Texas have the best win? Because if Oregon beats Washington. That's neutral site game. But Well, on the road Texas to, lost to neutral site game to Oklahoma. But on the road so. to Alabama and the way Alabama's been playing, like Texas and say we have the best win. But I think it's going to be Oregon because the committee is already showing you they're valuing Oregon over Texas right now with that order. So if everything stays the same, same it, Texas they're not going to have and if, if Bama well, loses the SEC championship against Georgia's two lost Bama one lost Washington. well well I, I think I think everybody we kind of make a mistake sometimes of looking at everything that's the same instead of looking at the things that are different right so what's the difference in Oregon beating Washington in the Pac-12 championship game as opposed to Texas beating Oklahoma how many losses does Oklahoma have they have two losses. Washington ha- now has one loss, which is to the, the team that, that they beat earlier at home, mm-hmm. right? Where did, where did Texas lose that game against Oklahoma during the regular season? Mm-hmm. They lost it at a neutral site. Where did Oregon lose their game during the, the regular road. season? On the road at Washington. So to me, if we're going to play it even and, and we're going to, to say, hey, what's different? Not just what's the same, but what's different? I think Oregon gets in, right? I think so. Does Bama winning the SEC championship help Texas's odds of getting in? Yes, yes. Yes. You want because it eliminates Georgia, in my opinion, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it honest. makes that win look even better. Yeah. yeah. And you have the tiebreaker over them. That's so that's great. exactly what you want. But, John, great Appreciate call. Appreciate it, bro. John. Great Thanks call. for calling, man. All right, let's go to Kirk in Canada. Kirk, what's up? Hey, guys. Kirky. Start bench cut. Hey, let's do what's it. going on? Let's do a start bench cut with McCarthy, Nix, and Penix Jr. <laughs> McCarthy, Nix, and Penix Jr. For what? A start bench cut. Yeah, but for, for to win the Heisman or to play in a college player. game oh, or to be in the NFL? Yeah, if you're if you're let's yeah, let's say you're the uh, GM of a team and and you got the number one overall pick. Who are you taking? I'm taking Bo Nix. I'm taking Bo Nix. I take Bo Nix. I'm sitting Michael Penix, and I'd probably cut JJ. I'm, I'm, that, I'm on that, that is probably the order I would have, even though I would do some very serious due diligence on Michael Penix's injuries, though. For Maybe sure. some For stuff sure. that we don't well, know. It, well, it, I think, too, if, and not that Penix can't run, but, but JJ can run. I mean, JJ can move. Mm-hmm. Like, JJ's sneaky. Sneaky. Um, I think that's a little bit of a difference there, and I think JJ's arm strength's really improved, too. Like, like you, and, hey, JJ's still a younger guy than yeah. both of them. And yeah. Imagine if he played for three more seasons and was a six-year senior like Bo Nix. I mean, Bo Nix three <laughs> years ago or J.J. McCarthy right now, we're having a different conversation. J.J. probably has a higher ceiling than all of them. Yeah, yeah. probably so. But the way I look, they're all draft eligible, so we've got to treat them all the same, right? Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. True. Before, before I hang up here, I, I'm going to give my two cents on the Harbaugh thing. Oh, go ahead. Do. The Harbaugh controversy. Now, I, I listen probably four out of five days. I don't catch every single episode, so you guys might have already touched Damn on it. Damn it, Kurt. Come on, man. Myself. Finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, uh, it's been my experience. Uh, when you touch people's idols, uh, they're going to come after you. And correct me if I'm wrong, but did not uh, Harbaugh publicly – at a pro-life rally not long ago, stand up for the unborn life. Yeah, for several unborn times. Child. Several times. Yeah, I, I think there's your issue right there, to be honest with you. Anybody in Hollywood, anybody who dares to touch their Moloch, their, uh, their idol, they're going to come after you. I, I, I really believe that's part of the issue. So I hope a Big Ten thing than an NCAA thing. I hope not. Well, the, the, what we're talking about this week is a Big Ten thing. The NCAA thing was the COVID cheeseburger thing. That yeah. he got punished for when he said, "I don't recall meeting with that." But I hope, I hope not, Kurt. I really hope not. I hope but not too. With this institution, right. you never know. <laughs> yeah. No, so thanks no. for calling hey, in, man. Saying that up and hey, thanks a lot, guys. Hey, all right. Hey, by the way, I just uh, just an update: the Flyers seven, seven and seven, seven overall. The Leafs eight and five overall. Hanging hey. in there, boys. Yeah. Hanging Kurt, in there, Kurt, boys. Can't wait. Oh man. man. Kurt, that that just got talked. Yeah, that red bill. Sound worried. That bill y'all wrote that, that, that Trudeau out. wrote crayon on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kirk. See you, Kirk. Thanks a lot, guys. Charlie in Pennsylvania. Charlie, what's up? Mm. Oh, he's an outbreak. Charlie in Hershey, Chocolate Pennsylvania? No, not Hershey. I'm in uh, Bushkill. 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 Bush okay, let's get it. 
But I grew up in New York on, in the Hudson Valley, in Rockland County, as I said last okay. time. Hey, guys, what a great show. What a great show. Kirk has a new name. He's Kirkules. Kirkules. I like that. Yeah. He, I, you know what? I know Kirk pretty well. He will accept that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I tell you what. I love his call and his logic. And by the way, four out of five shows he listens to, he ought to be running the NCAA because only four out of five conferences get to go to the playoffs. Mm. Big fact. Charlie always comes in with bars and they're not made of chocolate. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you would think the people running a college associated uh, sports thing would at least know how to count. No. Yeah, no. That's uh, look, no, it, Charlie. Knowing how to, uh, to count and do like things that, that are common sense, like in the human world, that, that gets you fired from the NCAA. That doesn't get you hired. Y'all know how to count? Yeah. So to, on a stellar program today, Coney gets the award with the Darth Vader uh, fine bomb. Uh, <laughs> wow. Was that it's brilliant? true. And, and true. True is, is better than even brilliant. So when the SEC finally realizes, and I'm talking to your fans, that Feinbaum has been trolling you for 30 years, mm -hmm. he's, he's a troll. I grew Wait. up in New York. I, I know this type of guy. Who was y'all's Feinbaum up there, Charlie? Who, who would you say is the closest to, to Feinbaum, you know, kind of up in your neck of the woods? It, it could be past. It could be present. Whatever. Is there, is there a comp? Yeah. No, because I'll tell you why. He's not in his element living mm. in the South. Okay, so he has to be a little more underhanded. Up in the North and in New York, uh, they're very overt. Yeah. So to come up with it, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah. In New York, yeah, they're openly. So and I don't want to go down that road because it could get very dicey. All I'm going to say is this. When I look at the lack of governance of the NCAA, and a message to Petiti, by the way, Michigan built the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. Michigan built Notre Dame. They didn't have a team until a bunch of boys from Ann Arbor went to South Bend and said, let's teach you boys how to put together a football team so we could come down and beat you up for the next 20 years. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yost went to Nebraska after being at Michigan and built their program. So the connections very similar to wrestling. If you get into the, the family tree of great college wrestling, you will find almost incest how connected they are. Yeah. Well, it's all, it all sprouts from one tree. Exactly right. And, 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 but this is all lost in the modern uh, times that we live. How about this for a logic? I grew up watching the Yankees try to beat the uh, Red Sox for the pennant. And what, what, what was that? You had to have a better record at the end of the season. Yeah. yeah. So if you're going to construct playoffs, you ought to at least have as many entries as there are divisions or conferences. And look at every other major sport. How many divisions are there in baseball and pro football? Yeah. It's I don't, I don't even know off the top of my head. There's so many, but then they have wild cards. Yeah. So yeah. Ben Shapiro I, makes a similar point with yeah, baseball. I, I agree. I mean, it does water down the regular season, but Charlie, again, hey, great Charlie, call, bro. Call in next week after the uh, hearing this Friday with Harbaugh. Yeah. Okay? We want to know what you think. Call in next week, brother. Go, go I'm ahead. So proud. I'm so proud of Michigan. Remind Timmy Brando about the Gilligan story. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's we, right. yeah, we that's talked right. to him about that. He laughed, man, when we brought that up. He remembered it. He did. I, I love Timmy. Hey, On you the guys airplane. are just perfect. Yeah, thanks, thank Charlie. You Charlie, great, thanks, Charlie. Charlie, thanks, buddy. For sure, it, I got a chocolatey you. goodness. Mm. I'm from the Hershey factory. factory. Yeah. All right, that's it today, boys. Devil Doc, Chris, y'all call in tomorrow, please. All right, what do we got in the chat before I head over the bets? Okay, let's go to Motorman213 with a $5 donation. He says, David, I'm curious your thoughts on Coach Moore's postgame comments. I love the raw emotion, but a lot of people criticize him for having it. Hashtag go blue. I was a little surprised to see the criticism. I mean, I thought Jake's take was a little bit more in line, like making fun of, oh, really, you're going to like get this emotional over that. That was a little bit more uh, appropriate, I thought, than people coming in and trolling and saying, oh, did Jim Harbaugh die? Like, I didn't know he died. Yeah. Like, think about this, man. If you're Sharon Moore, you just coached the biggest game for Michigan football this season mm -hmm. on 20 hours notice. 
Of course, those guys are emotional. You know, I, I don't necessarily uh, appreciate the profanity he was using at the very end. But what did he do? He did the same thing that Jim Harbaugh did. He deflected to his players as yeah. quickly as he possibly could. I, I, I think there's a little bit, if, if we're going to take it at face value, and let's just say that it, it wasn't a troll, that it was true emotion. Because part of me thinks Harbaugh <laughs> at halftime was like, hey, how much you want to bet you can run it every play of the second half and still win? How great would that be? Right. I think one of the reasons that he was so emotional, and I don't know him personally, right? So I'm just um, I don't either. I'm I'm guessing here a little bit, but just my instinct tells me. You think about his position, it's not just what happened for Michigan. It's that this is he's been an interim head coach before. He wants to be a head coach Mm -hmm. down the road. You just went to Penn State in a huge game, in a top ten matchup, in a game that everybody had their eyes on for multiple reasons. The head coach is not there. You get put as the interim, 20 hours notice, like you said, and you go win the game. I think that was as much about his career skyrocketing and him getting a huge feather in his cap for down the road. As, and you know what? I don't blame him for it. I, mean, I think it was a mixture of all of that. And he was impressed with, you know, obviously him deflecting the players. That's great. The profanity, you know, it, I, I don't mind it, to be honest with you. It's an emotional game. We've all been there. Uh, but... I think it had a lot to do with, hey, man, I just elevated myself, too. And it, and it could speak a lot to how they feel internally, the Wolverines, about all of this that's going on. I mean, when all this stuff came out about the Astros banging on the trash cans, I mean, you didn't see those guys getting overly emotional. It was kind of, it was more or less like, man, we did this thing and we got caught cheating and it's unfortunate. I just hope they don't strip us of a World Series title, yeah. which they probably should have been stripped. I think this showed you what they think about all of this, like viewing it more as a witch hunt. And John Harbaugh came out yesterday, the Ravens head coach, and was asked about his brother Jim and, and gave some details. Maybe we should pull that clip for tomorrow, but I thought that was interesting. He's always going to stand up for his brother, but still. For sure. You know. Yeah. Let's go to Tristan with the $5 donation. Appreciate it, Tristan. Would Arch Manning going to A&M with whoever their new coach is be the ultimate villain move? Hmm. That that would be, we're, we're starting to talk about, you know, hey, alternate universe Superman. You know, all of a sudden he's Brightburn. Like, he comes to start just killing everybody. True villain. Like, like it's. Some, look, it's like I said yesterday, man. You know, sometimes to reach the light, you need to embrace the darkness. The Mannings as villains? <sighs> what a great story. I don't know if it could happen. I, I just, here's the thing, though. I would, let's just ru- say Urban Meyer takes a job. Let's just say it. Let's throw it out there. Would Cooper Manning and the Manning family let their son play for Urban Meyer? Again, is that a good fit for what Urban Meyer wants to do at the quarterback position? When he had Alex Smith and Tim Tebow and... I mean, yeah, but he had Chris Leak and, like, I mean, he's... He didn't recruit Chris Leak, though. That that was a Ron Zook recruit. But, uh, yeah, but, I mean, he, you know... What a natty with him. He used him. I mean, it was... uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I, it's evolved. The game's evolved. Like, where's Urban Meyer at now? Yeah. Offensively. Like, I, I think that's the question. I was going to pop a job with the $10 donation. We did hit this earlier, so hopefully he got what he wanted. We can bring it back up if we need to. Did you guys see the next slasher hockey player was arrested for manslaughter? Yeah. Interesting, since you were wondering about the standing O on yesterday's show. Big love, guys. Love the show. Papa John, I'm pretty sure we heard, hit that for you. And not Drew Aller with the $5 donation. Not Drew Aller. Asgard. It's Asgard. Asgard. Thank you. I knew it wasn't Ragnarok. Love you, boys. Man, I knew it wasn't Ragnarok. It was Don't Asgard. Know, Y'all tried things. to play me. Um, Y'all thing, tried um, to play uh, me like an idiot. Breaking news real quick. Deshaun Watson's undergoing season-ending surgery for a broken bone. Wow. Oh, I thought it was going to be carpal tunnel. Um, that too, probably. That's funny. Uh, no, that's funny. Sorry, not him going undergoing season-ending injury. So that's official as of right now? Um, um, yes. Broken yeah, bone. Yeah, broken huh? I- ESPN. Wow. Ragnarok. Man, hell so no. Who's behind him? Ragnarok was the movie where, where that's like the apocalypse. It's Asgard. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right, we're going to get three life minutes. Wrong. Uh, hold on. Just walk this win off over here. <laughs> Asgard with that rainbow road. Whatever. All right, yesterday, David, 2 0 and Mac bets. You know what that go. makes me? Oh, hold on. Yeah, we'll hit it. Hold on. You make me happy. Super happy. <laughs> Super happy. Um, you love to see it. So why not? Let's go back to the well again, like that chick from the ring. Miami, Ohio, minus eight and a half at Ooh. home. Don't believe in who they're playing. Love Miami, Ohio on defense. 
Little side note, Miami, Ohio played Miami, Florida earlier in the year. You know what they call that? Y'all remember what they call it? They call that the... Uh, the Confusion Bowl, confusion. and it worked again on you guys. So, second bet, Central Michigan, plus 11. Not super in L with it, all right? Not super in love with it, but I think Bauer's kind of figuring out a little bit at the quarterback position. Let's just not... This game, Ohio and Central Michigan, has basically been the reincarnation of the same game like five out of the last six years. Like, it's almost exactly the same score outside of one time. It's been close. It's been a one-score game. Uh, so give me Central Michigan plus 11. Dude, we're double bet buds. We're double bet Has buds. that happened before? No, it ha- hasn't, man. I, hey, good luck to you tonight, bud. Double bet buds. Double bet buds. All right. <laughs> I'm pick something different, but now it's locked in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one and one yesterday, Toledo decided to show up in the fourth quarter. I can't believe the TTP hit um, over 30 and a half, but we'll take it. All right, no one knows what to bet in these games. Don't let them confuse it and act like they do. So what do you do <laughs> like this? You take Matt games. Overs. Matt, Matt games. Matt games. You take overs. So give me CMU Ohio over 46 and a half. Definitely not going to hit. Minus 105. <laughs> give me Buffalo and Miami of Ohio over 37 and a half. 39 and a half. 39 and a half. Sorry, I can read your handwriting. Let's How can you not read that handwriting? Are you dyslexic so, or blind? Don't take it Which so personal. It? And you and Ace are double bet buds. Yeah, okay, good. I'd rather run with Ace. I love it, Ace. Let's go. <laughs> um, oh, wow, y'all are. Except you got you got the over at 46 and a half. He got it at 46. So Ace will come down with me. I'm going to hit it at 46 and a half. That's minus 110. 39 and a half points. Let's just have a pulse, guys. Let's just yeah, have a pulse. Yeah, just figure it out. Somebody get the ball in the end zone. All right, what else we got? All right, uh, let's get to the poll. Should Arch Manny, someone's got to vote. All right. Someone's got to vote. Should Arch Manny transfer? Well, that means it's 50 50. But I want you to, where's it going to end? I'm gonna uh, say I'm gonna say they said yes, fifty percent. Well, you know I'm going with no then. Come on, someone get in there. No, fifty-one percent. No. Yes, for forty-nine percent. Toit, toit like a tiger. Yeah. All right, we appreciate you guys. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Got a great show for you tomorrow as well. Same time, we appreciate you in the chat. Appreciate everybody calling in. Uh, we try to get to everybody. And trying to open some more phone lines. I know there's, I get messages every day about people saying, hey, I'm trying to call, but it's on hold. We're trying to get that figured out. You are the best audience out there. Go find some of that merch. Check out Genius Cell, First Leaf, all the fantastic products, and get ready for that Black Friday sale from the Daily Wire. Like the chances of Quinn Ewers going number one overall. We're going, going. Gone. <laughs>